Hello everyone, Happy New Year if it's not too late and welcome to this evening's Facebook Live. I'm Claire, Clinical Manager at Wound Care People. Just to remind you, we're broadcasting last, last, uh, live from our homes, sorry. So if we have any problems, please do bear with us. Tonight's session is Children's Continence, Getting It Right From The Start. And our speakers are Davina Richardson, Children's Nurse Specialist, Bladder and Bowel UK, and Lynn Wilkinson, Children's Health Locality Manager and Lead for Children's Continence in Lincolnshire County Council. A big thank you to Essity for their support this evening. And just to let you know, certificates will be available at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Davina. Thank you, Claire. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the significant impact that incontinence has for children, young people and their families. I'm then going to look at how many children and young people are affected by the different types of incontinence and consider what common assumptions and misconceptions there still are before we look at the role of specialist services. Finally, I will provide some information on where healthcare professionals and families can find support and advice. A survey done by Essity in 2019 found that two thirds of young people are too embarrassed to tell a doctor if they have a bladder or bowel issue. However, we know that these problems have a significant impact on well-being. Young people who internalise a problem integrate it into their self-identity. They see the problem as part of their lives and something they need to actively manage. It's not something that controls or defines them. The problem might make them different or unique, but internalising helps young people realise it isn't something they've done or are doing wrong. And it helps them cope with worries about others finding out. But a lot of young people and children externalise bladder and bowel problems, and they see it as separate to themselves and as an intruder in their lives. They avoid thinking about the problem and try to convince themselves everything will be fine, even if they know this is unlikely. So those who externalise have a more significant psychological impact from wetting or soiling. Children and young people with bladder or bowel issues are likely to have poor self-esteem, and low self-confidence and psychological problems. They're more likely to be involved in bullying, either as perpetrator or as a victim. Bladder and bowel issues may inhibit normal socialisation. Children might avoid sleepovers, school trips, outings with friends. They carry the burden of a secret and that makes them avoid close relationships, including intimate ones as they get older. Having to miss school due to symptoms, appointments or even just missing lesson time to go to the toilet impacts on both school attainment and school achievement, which can have a knock on effect on employment opportunities as an adult. Also, many school staff don't really understand that not all children can wait until break time. Negative comments from staff and fear of others finding out inhibits families from sharing with school. So that results in negative perceptions of school for these children and young people. There's also the potential for abuse of children and young people due to their continence issues. This may be as a result of inappropriate punitive responses, and we do need to be alert to these. Also, very rarely, fortunately, incontinence may be caused by abuse, that urinary tract infection or trauma from sexual abuse or damage following female genital mutilation can all result in incontinence. Besides all of those, parents may become stressed or frustrated with their child, particularly if they think the child or young person is not bothered or isn't trying. And all these problems combine to create poor quality of life, not just for the child or young person, but for the family as well. And we know that appropriate treatment improves quality of life and can resolve the psychological problems. And Van Heersel actually found that effective treatment for bedwetting improves sleep and therefore daytime neuropsychological functioning. And clinical experience is that children's self-esteem and behaviour improves once they have successful treatment for any incontinence. Not all problems resolve in childhood. Research tells us that somewhere between half and 3% of adults have persistent primary nocturnal enuresis. That is bedwetting that's continued from their early years into adulthood. The Bladder and Bowel UK helpline receives calls from adults who report problems since childhood. And I've met a number of young adults and older teenagers whose problems initiated very early in life, who've never been fully clean and dry from toilet training, have had no treatment or were discharged prior to achieving continence as the service felt they had no more to offer them. Children with lower urinary tract symptoms were found by herons to be more likely to become adolescents and then adults with bedwetting. If we go back to the punitive responses that I mentioned on the last slide, Wright found that older children were more likely to be punished than younger ones. 
That may be because parents felt they should be able to control their bladder and bowels. But we also know that adolescents are likely to have much more severe symptoms than younger children, possibly because the more severe symptoms are less likely to resolve spontaneously. A study by Akaji and Tamita found that over 2,500 to 80 year old parents and grandparents of children with bedwetting had a, history of, um, had a history of bedwetting themselves, were much more likely to develop nocturia and urgency than adults with diabetes, hypertension, or neurological diseases. And in the adults aged 30 to 49, the incidence of nocturia and urgency was higher than in those who were more than 12 years old when their bedwetting resolved and two to four times more of the adults in their 60s and 70s who needed to avoid twice a night or more had troubling urgency interfering with daily life had bedwetting as a child than those who did not. So if we look at prevalence, constipation is usually um, accepted as affecting about 30% of children and young people in the UK, although the figures tell us between one and 31% of infants and toddlers have constipation. It becomes chronic in about a third of all the children who experience it, and that is where symptoms persist for more than eight weeks. For 17 to 40 percent of children, it actually starts in the first year of life, but the peak incidence is between two and four years of age. We can see from the figures on the screen there that there's a huge financial impact to the NHS of constipation in terms of prescribed laxatives, hospital admissions, a and &E attendances, as well as the paediatric outpatient appointments, including at gastroenterology clinics. If we were more proactive in informing parents of the signs and symptoms of constipation, it would be diagnosed early. And if we followed nice guidance correctly on treating promptly with laxatives, rather than just relying on diet, fluid and exercise, fewer children would get chronic constipation. Many healthcare professionals don't recognise the symptoms of constipation in typically developing children, nor do they realise that children with additional needs are at much higher risk of constipation. And this can be associated with differences in mobility, muscular tone, diet, fluid intake, behaviour. All the reasons may actually not be obvious, but what we do know is that early treatment remains really important for all children, including those with additional needs, if we're going to avoid megarectum, megacolon, and ongoing problems with defecation and toilet training with the negative impacts that we've already discussed. Children with organic issues, that's those who've been born with anatomical differences, such as anal rectal malformations, those who have neuropathic bowels, or who have sustained damage to their spinal cord nerves, account for much, much, much smaller numbers, less than 5% of all children with faecal incontinence. But they have a very high incidence of constipation, so they should be on proactive bowel management programs. Bedwetting, we know it resolves spontaneously in up to 16% of children each year. But those who wet the bed more frequently, so on this slide, the 1.4% who are wetting two to five nights a week and the 1% who wet it nearly every night are much less likely to get better spontaneously. So these children should be prioritised for early treatment. Lifestyle advice can be given at any age and active treatment can commence from a child's fifth birthday. Bedwetting affects more boys than girls until the teenage years, and the incidence does re reduce with increasing age. But by teenage years, the incidence is similar between the different genders, and that suggests that girls may be less likely to recover spontaneously. By the age of 13, most of those who have bedwetting are wet for three or more nights a week, so the impact on the quality of life is likely to be significant. What's particularly interesting are figures that come from the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, also known as the Children in the 90s study. This was the largest group of children to, um, recruited to a longitudinal study of child development ever. And of the nearly 6,000 children born in Avon between 1991 and 92, parents and children responded to regular surveys, which included questions about continence at the ages of four and a half, nine and a half and 14. It was found that children with bedwetting and no daytime symptoms at nine and a half were three and a half times more likely to have bedwetting at 14 than children who were dry at nine and a half. Those with daytime wetting and bedwetting when they were nine were 23 times more likely to have bedwetting at the age of 14. And those with daytime wetting and bedwetting at nine were also twice as likely to have nocturia and urgency when they were 14. We do know, however, that occasional bedwetting during childhood has not been linked to adult incontinence. So if we then look at the prevalence of daytime wetting, Again, the top two figures here, 15.5% of four and a half year olds and nearly 5% of nine and a half year olds who are affected by daytime wetting came from the, those ALSPAC figures. 
daytime wetting affects large numbers of children at when the littler age group and obviously less as they get older. And that's why it's often dismissed in younger children. But it may be related to later toilet training, to constipation, which we know is more prevalent in the younger age groups. Um, but severe daytime urinary continence, that's daily wetting, affects about 1% of seven-year-olds. Again, the ALSPAC data has shown us that those with daytime wetting at nine years of age are 10 times more likely to have daytime wetting at 14 years old than the children who are dry at nine. And daytime wetting in nine and a half year old girls was also associated with an increased risk of voiding postponement and hard stools. So at 14 years of age, the ALSPAC group found that 0.6% of children reported day and nighttime wetting and 2.2% reported wetting during the day alone. So that's two children out of every hundred are actually wetting during the day at, as teenagers. Low urinary tract symptoms we know are often associated with constipation and daytime wetting often occurs alongside nighttime wetting. What we also know is all of our prevalence figures may be under estimates. Our children and young people underreport, and so do their parents, partly because of a lack of recognition or understanding, partly because of the embarrassment we spoke about at the beginning. To us, wetting can be any volume of leakage, whereas for families, a dribble of urine in the pants is often associated with leaving it the last minute, therefore laziness or potentially naughtiness of their child. Other issues associated with um, continence issues in children. A study published by Joinson in 2018 found that starting toilet training after 24 months of age was associated with daytime wetting, delayed bladder control and persistent wetting at school age. And we know that many families are now waiting to toilet train their child until they appear ready, which for many isn't until they're three years old. Children spend up to half their waking hours in school, but they're often reluctant to use the toilet there. And that may well be due to the state of the toilets or the behaviour of other children or simply reduced privacy, the fear that another child will hear them going and laugh. Boys are taught to empty the bladder standing and with others, but there are social issues for them around defecating. And it can be very obvious if they go into a cubicle at school. Girls, on the other hand, we're taught to hide when we're either voiding or defecating. And at school, they may want to avoid sitting on the toilet, particularly if they're dirty. Crouching prevents pelvic floor re re relaxation, which may ultimately result in voiding dysfunction, incomplete emptying and recurrent UTI. And some children will avoid fluid intake, as we know at school, to avoid using the toilets completely, which may cause constipation. Many school staff seem to know that the children's toilets are in a poor state, but don't seem to understand the impact on child health. So we got together with Eric, uh, Bladder and Bowel UK, and Eric wrote some guidance for schools about children's bladder and bowel issues, and the link for that is on the presentation there. Delayed toilet training is obviously, op is, sorry, often considered inevitable in children who've got disabilities. But if we don't offer early assessment to every child with an identified developmental difference, then we might miss structural abnormalities. We know that congenital bladder and bowel issues are more common in children with disabilities, particularly in those with Down syndrome. But if no assessment is done, things like ectopic ureters or posterior urethral valves may be missed. The latter causes high pressure bladder, which can result in a, eventually in end stage renal failure. We also know that disability is associated with increased risk of constipation that can negatively impact the bladder as well as the bowel. Due to lack of support and acceptance of continence difficulties, children are more likely to become those adults we spoke about earlier with premature bladder and bowel issues. We've even had deaths of young adults reported who have learning disabilities because of constipation that was poorly managed. Joinson found that developmental delay at 18 months of age was associated with daytime wetting, delayed bladder control and day and nighttime wetting, but not bed wetting on its own. Therefore, children with developmental issues should also be offered treatment for bed wetting, as well as support to toilet trainers early age. There are lots and lots of misconceptions out there still. But, and I think part of that's because as healthcare professionals, we don't get much training on childhood bladder and bowel issues. One of the key ones is that um, symptoms are self-limiting in childhood. And for some children, they are, particularly if they're infrequent. But for most, they are not. And as we've already said, incidence is higher in children with some conditions, including disabilities, ADHD, autism, learning difficulties. But most of the problems are caused by the bladder or bowel issues, not the underlying health, con um, health condition or diagnosis. So all children should be offered assessment and appropriate treatment. Many families, social care and education professionals think that soiling and wetting are due to laziness, naughtiness, avoidance of the toilet, distraction, behavioural issues, deep sleep, stress or emotional issues. 
I have yet to meet a lazy child. They might seem naughty, but usually children are very busy and they behave in a way to solve a problem for themselves rather than a way to deliberately upset or annoy an adult. Behavioural issues, sleep and emotional problems can all be the result of incontinence and often resolve when the incontinence is treated. The impact of the misconceptions and this wait and see approach is not appropriate for children and families and ends up in needless suffering and potentially long term implications. As healthcare professionals with work with children, we should have a basic understanding of what is typical, how to assess and be able to offer first line interventions, as well as know how and when and where to refer on if problems are not resolving or appear complex. So that brings us on to specialist continence services. These should be provided for all children and young people with bladder and or bowel health issues. That includes up to the age of 16 or 18 for those with typical development and up to 19 for those with additional needs. But there should be no gaps with adult services. It's not OK to say the children's service stops at 16, but the adult service won't start till they're 18. Care should be available as early in life as required. For some children, this will be from shortly after birth, although those with congenital issues are usually initially supported at the tertiary referral centre. But babies as young as six months can have idiopathic constipation, so care should be available for them. And children with identified special needs should be supported to work on the skills for toilet training from the beginning of the second year of life. All healthcare professionals who work with children should have a basic understanding of typical bladder and bowel anatomy, physiology, development, and the influences on this. They should be able to provide basic first line advice and be able to signpost families to appropriate evidence based information to support this and to local specialist services if required. They should be aware of NICE and of red flags and the specialist services have a role in providing the education and training both formally and informally. Not all continence conditions are straightforward, nor are all children and families. And it's particularly difficult for adolescents, not only due to the challenges of this stage of development, but due to the background that's frequently the feeling the need to hide an embarrassing and stigmatising condition from their peers, coping with the burden of secrets and feeling different. This is often set against the backdrop of previous treatment failure, personal parental frustration and anger. So these young people particularly need understanding, empathy, experienced and knowledgeable practitioners who are up to date with current thinking and can provide practical solutions a child or young person can manage. And that's a key role of the specialist service. Specialist services can deliver clear care pathways, smooth transition between level one and three services and on into adulthood as required. And with the right input, most children will attain full continence or at least significant improvement. Specialist services don't exist in a bubble. They need to work alongside the paediatric multidisciplinary team, including social care and education, but they have a role in educating adult continence services about childhood conditions which may persist, and that helps with the transition of care. Smooth transition to adult pathway services, as per NICE, um, for those who need it, and appropriate pathways should also be used, and the specialist continence service can advise and support with those. So where can we get other information? Well, there's lots of information on the Bladder and Bowel UK website and um, our email address and links to our um, resources are there. NICE provides us with guidance and quality standards on bedwetting, on constipation, on urinary tract infection in children and also on transition to adult services. The International Children's Continent Society provides lots and lots of information. And for families, there are websites that are available, such as the Stop Bedwetting one. So bladder and bowel issues, we've shown how they can affect any child and they do affect lots of children. We've talked about constipation being the most common and if it's not addressed promptly, it can cause bladder issues that can result in long-term continence problems due to the impact development of megarectum and megacolon. Continence issues have a huge negative impact for the child, their family, for NHS resources and wider society as reduced educational attainment impacts on long-term productivity and increasing use of containment products that are made from oil has an impact on the environment. Missing red flags can, in extreme and fortunately rare cases, result in end-stage re renal failure or even death from constipation. We should be advocating for families and we should be challenging the misconceptions that are out there still. We should su support the development of specialist services so that children are proactively assessed and treated um, by appropriately trained healthcare professionals. I want to finish by giving my final words to, to a young person who was asked to describe what incontinence felt like. And they reported that it was not life-threatening, but it was life-ruining. So we need to work together to make sure that no other child, young person, 
ever thinks or says this about what are actually treatable bladder and bowel health issues. So thank you for listening. I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand you over to Lynn, who's going to talk about the development of a specialist children's continent service. Thank you, Davina, and good evening, everybody. Um, what I wish to talk about tonight is um, with regards to the service that we are setting up within Lincolnshire, part of Lincolnshire County Council. Um, so I'd like to look at what we found in Lincolnshire to be able to develop a business case for a proposed um, specialist service, steps that we took to engage with the clinical commissioning groups of the CCG, meeting with the lead GP from main practice and also the GP from the CCG, the service development, I'd like to look at a case study presenting the benefits that we've already seen from this work and also go um, on to look at out, outcome um, and next steps. So what we found in Lincolnshire um, around containment product, we moved over to ST at the same time as transitioning from the NHS service to local authority. We utilised this as a fresh start to review the current service we had. The service had transitioned sorry, from being an NHS school nurse service to a children and young people's nurse service. The role had changed and focus was more on the health of the child rather than in safeguarding um, in the school nurse offer. ST worked with us to look at this and review the products we were currently providing. Um, it was this close working arrangement that supported us to start to look at where, um, where we were and what we needed to deliver within um, Lincolnshire. We were trained by ST to use the Indigo system, which is a system for ordering and where all the products sit, which meant that we started to receive reports on all children who were due a continent review, were over the age of 19 or nearly 19 years old, so that we could complete the transition to adult services. We never had access to this kind of information and our own system one was not always accurate as markers had not been updated. We utilised these reports to review every child in receipt of products who were on the system. This led to us to be able to discharge um, a large number of children who didn't require products any longer. Um, most of them um, had become continent. Um, as all the cleansing work had been completed, we were able to then focus on the actual assessment and best practice. We utilised the consensus document 2019 and wrote tr new training sessions for tier one staff, including family health workers, health visitors and children and people's nurses. And this was on assessing toileting skills and focusing on support um, for children to become as independent with their bladder and bowel conditions, many resulting in the child becoming continent or where they were more independent in the use of products. This was a steep learning curve for a lot of staff who had previously seen the service as a free nappy one but the majority of staff were on board and, and training has become mandatory. It was this work that enabled us to provide um, the evidence of what the bladder and bowel needs of children are within Lincolnshire. We were also able to gain significant evidence of children becoming continent um, with the support and had made significant product savings across three financial years. It also meant working collaboratively with other professions, promoting their learning and thus supporting the children's needs and further development within Lincolnshire. The specialist nurse within ST also supplied, su supported us, um, having access to um, her um, conducting joint um, appointments to work to ensure that we had met um, all of the more complex health needs. A part of this was also supporting staff learning. This has been so valuable as they are also expert on the tenor product and are able to um, support children where a standard product has not been suitable. They've also been instrumental in us linking with specialist nurses elsewhere in the country. In conjunction with ST, we've been able to develop a child specific product formulary. The one shown in the slide is the standard, pro standard products list with a range of tenor products and also PNS washable products. This standard list is available to all tier one staff. And we also have a separate specialist formulary available to tier two service only. Should a tier one child require a more specialist product, they would need to liaise with the tier two staff and assess the need then authorise as required. Steps were taken to engage with the CCG and the Commissioning Guide 2019 supported it. I was able to use this document and evidence gathered in the earlier caseload reviews to share my findings with my manager and one of the commissioning team. It was this evidence that highlighted the positive impact this could have on children in Lincolnshire but also the financial savings from preventative element of the work. We also needed to acknowledge that this would also reduce the number of children in tier three services or on long-term medication, for example, constipation, that was not necessarily needed. 
we have a number of referrals to linkage paediatrics that do not require that service. Um, and it also um, comes with a significant cost. Having a specialist three tier service could prevent inappropriate referrals through to tier three. This as a whole captured the attention of the CCG and the commissioning team started to present all of their findings to them. They utilized the layout of the commissioning guide to present that case for Lincolnshire. This information comprised a business case, wrote, um, recommended service specification and an integrated pathway of services. We also developed a working group um, with the local GP who was in support of the project, the commissioning team, lead nurse for children's health, lead nurse for children with disabilities team, and also myself. We reviewed all of the documents and made any amendments. They were then sent and presented to the CCG. Once the CCG had agreed the service, we were able to then start to look at all of the other elements within it. Prescribing. I met with a local GP to review how this could work. We looked at short to medium term plan and then the longer term. Short to medium, we developed two forms, one for bowel and one for nocturnal enuresis and daytime wetting. They are designed to be completed by the continent specialist nurses with a full assessment and then recommendation of medication as per NICE guidance. This is then sent to the GP who completes the prescription, but the continents do all of the monitoring and the following up of that. The GP is kept informed of the case throughout. These have since been shared with the CCG and the lead GP um, and presented at the medical board in Lincolnshire and were signed off. These forms will be on system one, which is our record keeping platform. And this is because most GPs in Lincolnshire are also on the same system so that forms can be shared within that. So also trying to be paper light service. Where a GP is not on system one, we will need to post paper copies to them. The longer term plan, we are currently looking at how we can introduce the prescribing qualification. And there is some discussion as to whether this needs to be the V100 non-medical prescribing or the V300 independent prescribing. Um, this is still to be agreed, but on scoping, many seem to choose the V100 as the best option. You are able to, um, able to prescribe from that for bowel preparations, but would not be able to prescribe desmopression or medication for daytime wetting. But these could be completed with the forms that we've already developed as part of the short to medium term plan. Referrals. The GPs wanted a very simple process for referral. We already had developed a referral form um, into the children and young people's nurses and health visitors at tier one. So that has been adapted with a new section for the children's continent service tier two. The GP can advise parents to call our single point of access for less urgent cases as parents are still able to self-refer into the tier one element of the service. But tier two referrals will only be via professionals um, and not a self-referral service. We've also utilized a referral checklist that was shared to us from Derby. This is now developed for the local service and sits within the integral referral process to tier two services. The referral process is completed within system one from children and young people's nurses and health visitors staff. The reason we opted for the checklist is to ensure that care has been completed at tier one level first. The service specification identifies three referral types through to tier two. They are two day for urgent cases where the child needs to be seen quickly or where red flags have been identified within our service. Two week referrals are for constipation and more urgent bladder symptoms and the four week referral is for routine um, referrals. Service development. Um, staff recruitment, we're extremely lucky. Um, we have one whole time equivalent children's continence lead we have two whole time continents deputy nurses, and we're also funded two additional children and young people's nurses to support the tier one and the extra work that they would be completing. We already have a standard operating procedure for tier one children and young people's nurses and health visitors. We do need to put some amendments in that though with our tier two element when the service goes live on the 1st of February. The tier two SOP is yet to be written um, and we will develop that in the early days of the service. Um, we've also looked at pathways. We have an integrated care pathway as per service specification that is already developed. And this includes GP, children and people's nurses, health visitors and children with disabilities team. It specifies what each role um, they have within each professional team. Children and people's nurses already have individual care um, pathways within tier one um, SOP to guide them and we are developing new bladder um, and bowel ones based on the new work that we were doing that wasn't previously included in the children and young people's nurse specification. 
all of this work we have based on what is in the consensus document 2019. Um, tier development and roles as well as training. The children and people's nurses have already received more advanced training on continents and including more on the constipation and soiling, which has not been included before. The health visitor element was developed around the toileting skills development as we are moving away from referring to it as toilet training. Developing toileting skills can be started from birth, whereas toilet training is only about the actual toileting element, and, that is, and it is much more than that. Also, toilet training is often associated with a certain age group and not a progressive development and learning of the skills. Due to these changes, we've developed trainings to, for staff to ensure that they have the knowledge and skills to fulfill this element of the role. It is also part of the Health Child Programme. This led on to looking for competencies for staff, and we've decided to use the PCF, which is Paediatric Continence Forum, competencies, as these are written for both Level 1 and 2 staff. We have also looked at local competencies as part of the pathways and individual work. All staff have been sent a copy of these and are expected to complete them. And we do have an audit process to follow that up. Um, NICE. We review all relevant NICE guidance within the service and they are fed through our clinical governance and quality group. The two most recent that have been re reviewed are the CH179, which is pressure ulcers, prevention and management, um, and NG34, which is transition from children's to adult services. We found for both we're currently only partially compliant. So we have developed an in-depth action plan for both. For the pressure ulcers, we have reviewed and adapted the Braden Q scale risk assessment for skin integrity to be more of a community tool. The Braden Q was predominantly um, a hospital tool before. All children having a continence assessment will receive this assessment um, and advice given on preventative measures for skin health. This will include products to support um, uh, skin health as well. We're also looking to adapt our Datex, which is a reporting system, to ensure that we're able to report any tissue damage of any grade to a child. We will work with GPs currently to aid healing or for any prescriptions for preventative products, such as barrier creams or dressings. If we do go for the V100 prescribing, the tier two nurses will be able to accept these cases and prescribe in-house as well. I next wanted to share a case study of benefits that we've already found. Um, one child that I completed a joint home visit on, this was prior to the tier two service um, being set up, but would now actually fall would under, um, under this service at this time. The mother contacted the service as a child was around five years old and she'd been advised that she would receive free nappies. She needed a larger size for her child as the current one type. The mother was advised that toileting skills and other parts of the assessments highlighted that this child had the ability to gain toileting skills and we could support them with an individual plan of care. She did become verbally aggressive towards staff, but this was only due to frustration and she often thanked staff for all of their support. She had been told by their consultant that their son would not be toilet trained until he was at least a teenager, so it's no wonder that she became very upset and confused. At the visit, we were able to highlight that he may not be able to verbally communicate and say that he needed the toilet, but he had other methods such as non-verbal signals, pet cards, and even adapted um, tablet. Whilst in the visit, we asked the mother to show us the bathroom so that we could check the equipment. They had the correct type of toilet seat and step, and it was all within the correct seating position. While we were talking, he actually sat on the toilet with his jeans up, but he did sit there for 10 minutes very happily playing with his tablet. At night time, her, um, she reported that in the morning he would get up and he'll be dry most mornings. But rather than take him straight to the toilet, they would go downstairs for breakfast. She would then not change his product until it had become filled during the morning. We were able to advise and support her to change that routine to go straight to the bathroom and allow him to pass urine. This has led to him not needing the product at night time. Um, but we do have some more support work that we need to do with them around that morning routine. For daytime wetting, due to some pressures on the mother, we agreed to compromise and use a washable rather than a disposable product. This has allowed him to pull his own clothing up and down, um, and he has also taken himself to the toilet independently on a few occasions. This is a huge step forward for him and his development towards independence, and we are now able to continue to support them as a family. Outcomes and next steps. Tier three pathways and referral. These have proved the most difficult um, element of this plan um, and process so far. We've contacted all of the tertiary hospitals as well as the local trust, which is ULHT. 
the tertiary hospitals of Sheffield and Nottingham mainly for the Lincolnshire area. We are wanting to meet and discuss direct referrals from our service, but also look at a step up, step down approach. This will also involve supporting children within Lincolnshire who may be receiving specialist treatments in Nottingham and Sheffield, but where the children um, or family need that support locally. This may include working with schools when required to ensure that all services are working together and that the child has one plan of care. COVID has significantly affected this, but we have made contact and we will continue to work on these referral pathways. Training for professionals. The main aim of the service is prevention and ensuring advice um, and guidance is given from birth, that children with complex health needs are assessed and care plans developed with them as individuals. We will also offer training to schools and other professionals. We have already got close links to our special schools, but as more children are within mainstream, we need to also review that offer. Our aim is to prevent conditions that are preventable and reduce the number of inappropriate referrals to tier three services. Educational sessions um, we're also looking to deliver before any one-to-one -one appointment. Um, I've spoken to other areas and they also reviewed that and they offer development um, and education packages to parents in groups, including prevention on constipation, fluid and diet and also um, physical health. This will be to all families um, as a first point, um, first point of call um, before they have any one to one consultation. In other areas, they've done this and they found that high numbers of children do then not require individual appointments as increasing fluid alone um, has resolved the issue. We could do these as face-to-face -face groups, but as parents um, are then all going through the same thing, they can get advice from each other. But we also need to look to develop some vi videos and maybe have them on YouTube where we can send the link out to parents, especially in times of COVID. We also have a children's Facebook page where we can share these preventative mes messages. Um, recruitment. We've been extremely lucky. We had one vacancy and we've now recruited to that vacancy um, and they will be starting with us on the 1st of March. Audit. We started to develop some audit tools. These will need to become a yearly um, mandatory practice. And we are looking at record keeping, staff training and staff competencies audits. Staff will also receive back to the floor assessments carried out on a face to face by a manager twice a year. We will also continue to review our services against national documents, including those from NICE, and create an additional action plans required. Annual review. That will review will be against the service and what we're offering and identify any gaps. This will enable us to share the evidence with the CCG and review the contract again. Performance. This is similar to what we have said in the audit. We have agreed a list of monthly performance and um, reportable objectives, and we've already met with our performance team to scope this. We have a plan set um, that the first run will take place in January as a baseline to start formal reporting from February this year. This includes, for example, the number of referrals we, we receive, where they're from, individual carers' confidence to manage conditions on discharge um, that the child has seen um, as being seen, sorry, within the specified waiting times. Transition to adult care. We need to meet with our adult service to strengthen this offer and ensure that we are aligned to the NICE guidance. Currently, this does not start until they are 18 years, six months. This needs to change to us preparing them around the age of 14 to 15 years old and to include a six month post transition check in. This agreement will very much depend on those talks and um, with the adult service, who are a separate organisation to us. We do already have very close working links though for those um, transition points. There are still elements that we um, can do solely though to aid that transition further. Thank you for listening. And I would now like to hand back to Claire. Thank you very much, Lynn. And thank you, Davina, for your earlier session as well. Um, for further information regarding how SET works with their NHS partners, or to discuss the support packages and products that are available, you can contact either your local SET representative or email hcmarketing at SET.com. So we're now going to move over to our real-time uh, question and answer session. And remember, you can still take part at any time by commenting on the video. So we're now going to move on to our first question, who we're going to give Lynn a rest now. Uh, and we're going to give this first question to Davina. And Davina, this is from Joe. Has there been an increase in bed wetting or daytime wetting as a result of COVID 
and the stress and changes that children are having to experience. Oh, I have no idea is a simple answer to that, but that would make a very interesting piece of work. Um, I don't know. We're getting a lot more calls to our helpline, I can tell you that, but that and the calls are much more complex in nature. But that seems to be largely because a lot of services were redeployed, particularly in the first wave. And we're becoming aware that services are being in some instances redeployed again to help with vaccination, for example. Um, but the simple answer is, I don't know. We do know that that bedwetting can be associated with stress, but that isn't the primary cause for most children and young people. Um, and most children and young people do have very supportive families. So I would be surprised if there's been a significant increase, but the simple answer is I don't know. Okay, well, what we could do, uh, we do have question and answers posted on the Facebook page um, on, the, on the site. So we can maybe um, actually get the, the answers and, and have a look around possibly and, uh, and answer that one later at a later date maybe. Um, yeah, I mean that would be an, <laughs> it would be an interesting piece of research, yes, but I don't really know how we how we actually tackle that. Okay. Um, okay. So the next question is for you also, Davina, and it's from Janet. Uh, could you give some advice on children that will only open their bowels in a nappy and not on the toilet? That is such a common problem that we actually wrote a leaflet about it. So there is a leaflet on that about that on the. Um, Bladder and Bowel UK website under children resources and then bowels. Um, what we suggest is we allow them to have the nappy on to open their bowels, but take the nappy off as soon as they have done um, and only put the nappy on and take it off in the bathroom. When the child's used to that approach, we then put the nappy on in the bathroom and encourage the child to stay in the bathroom for an increasing amount of time using distraction, games, whatever, to keep them there for, for gradually increasing periods of time. When they're in the bathroom the whole time the nappy's on, then we start to put their bottom on the toilet as soon as the nappy goes on and then gradually increase the amount of time they're on the toilet or the potty if that's where they sit. And then we can actually just lay the nappy over the toilet seat or the, the potty, um, obviously making sure they're not going to fall off if it's on the toilet and get them to poo on that and then gradually move that nappy away from the bottom. And that works very effectively for most children. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Lynn and it comes from Samantha. Who do we go to regarding advice on toilet training with children with multiple disabilities? Um, in Lincolnshire, um, we have got a children with disabilities team, so we would need to look at which team that would fall under. Um, but obviously our children and young people's nurse team, um, they um, support children from age five through to 19. And once we've finished the work with the health visitors, they will also have advanced training around those toileting um, discussions. Part of our um, children and young people's work is with children that have got quite complex needs. Um, and some of it is actually bringing people together so that all of those needs are met. So it would very much depend what exactly the complex needs are to which particular team that would go to. Can I, can I chime in as well, Claire, saying to more, yes, wi um, more widely than Lincolnshire, we're certainly recommending starting work on the skills for toilet training, as Lynn so eloquently put it, um, from the beginning of the second year of life, even in children with complex needs. And that's so that these children get a proper assessment. We don't miss any underlying problems, but also so they can start working on their skills early and they become embedded in the child's normal daily routine. And again, there's lots of information on our website about early toilet training and people can ring our helpline professionals or parents can ring the helpline to ask for some early pointers um, but we would suggest speak to your local children's continent service if there is one or to your own healthcare professional and healthcare professionals can come and ask for support if they need it. Lovely thank you very much. Um, the next question is again for you Davina. Um, what, what tips would you recommend to help children with visual disabilities successfully toilet and become dry? That's a difficult one because it, it's the same as for anything, any other skill. We have to actually work with the senses the child has got. So it's about may, helping them to navigate around the house, keeping the potty if that's what they're using in exactly the same place all the time, giving them means of communicating when they need to go and actually introducing those skills really early. So it's exactly the same in many respects as it is for any other child, but taking into a consideration the fact they haven't got their vision to help them. So we'll teach, still be teaching them to dress and undress. We'll teach, still be teaching them to sit down and get up. Um, we'll still be teaching the difference between wet and dry. We'll still be giving them language to use around the toilet. So all of those early skills that we're developing with them will be exactly the same. And then it's about how they position themselves. It's about having the right equipment. So again, the OT might be helpful if they need a potty chair rather than a potty. So it's more sturdy and, and less easy to knock over. That sort of thing might help as well. 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Shani and it's for, for you, Davina. Um, do you recommend waking the child at night time to go to the toilet? Never. Um, that used to be given as advice and still is sometimes. What we now know is that children wet at any stage of sleep um, and that if we start waking them up to go to the toilet, their bladder may not be full um, and most children don't wake fully. So we actually cause two more problems if we use it in the long term. One is that we're encouraging them to empty before the bladder's full. And the second is we're encouraging them to empty when they're not fully awake. And most children, if you ask them the following day, did mummy take you to the toilet last night? Did daddy take you to the toilet? They'll say, no, they didn't. And mum's sitting there saying, yes, I did. And they say, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I was asleep all night. So actually, it doesn't actually help the underlying problem so we no longer recommend that as a treatment it's it's fine in the short term two or three nights to keep a bed dry when you're away from home it's fine but as a long term absolutely not okay thank you um the next question is for you lynn and it's from emma is it helpful to have a specific special needs focus role within a pathway to consider additional impacts such as sensory needs and communication aids um, we do take that into account, but we try not to focus on that. Obviously, with um, visual, we would need to look at different packages of care. Um, and I think with all children, it's very much looking at what their individual needs are. Um, but we certainly don't try to have them as a sideline. As, as Davina said, we try and um, give every, every child exactly the same information um, and look at the, the, the way that they can learn those skills. So we do have elements of that in our standard operating guidance, but we certainly would not treat them any differently um, to any other child. Um, we have also started links with our OT services. They've recently been um, and shared with us with regards to the products. And we also link in where a child has had a sensory assessment and then we will plan our care around, around that. But with regards to the, um, the standard messages that we give, we, you know, we certainly don't use disabilities as any reason to, as to why that child can't. Um, it would just be on an individual basis. OK, great. Um, the next question is from Kyla and it's for, for Davina. Um, has there ever been any research or links found between neurodiversity and bladder issues? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, certainly there are some um, reports of neurodiversity and bowel issues, particularly with the way the microbiome in the bowel is, but I've not actually come across it with bladder issues at all. And if a child has a bladder issue, as Lynn has just said, for all children with special needs, we treat them as individuals as we do with every other child. We meet them where they are and we give them an individualised package of care according to the standard pathways. So the Within a standard pathway, there's a huge variation of what we can actually provide. I have met children who've got um, autism, for example, who have got bladder issues, plenty of them, and we know they're more prone to them. But these children can be treated just as successfully as their typically developing peers. OK, thank you. Um, the next question is from Melanie, and it's for you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we have one children's nurse and one nursery nurse for the whole of the county. <laughs> Any more advice or tips on putting together a business plan um, as we need more staff? Definitely. We, I have the commissioning guide um, that was in my presentation and I very much use that as my go-to. Um, our business plan was very much laid out in exactly the same process. And I think it's about gathering the information and the evidence to back up what the needs are in your area. And obviously for us, we were extremely lucky because we were working with Essity. We'd not only got our system one records, but we were also able to run reports from the Indigo um, system as well. So that gave us the information as to exactly what the needs were within Lincolnshire, what we could do better for the children of Lincolnshire to move away from the old free, free nurse, uh, you know, um, product provision, et cetera, because that's not, not what it's about. Um, and getting best outcomes for children, but that commissioning guide should be all you need. Um, and, and that's and we use that to base it on um, what children we got, the levels of those children and what staff we needed. Um, and there was no there was no discussion around it. That was what was presented in our business plan and they accepted it straight away. We were lucky. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and another one for you, Lynn, uh, from Vicky. We've tried all advice regarding our 10 year old never, never dry at night, but now have been told 
that we have to wait a minimum of 12 months before they can get seen by the continent specialist. What advice could you give? Right, obviously I, I don't know the case, so I don't know why there's then a 12 month delay. Um, obviously we do, um, we've got enuresis pathways and we have them for both tier one and tier two. Um, our pathway is very much once you've um, exhausted everything within tier one and you're not seeing any development at all it's then you know even if it's just a discussion with those tier two specialist nurses to see what those next steps are whether that needs to be that a consultant needs to review the child they need more in-depth um assessments etc um I, I'd, I'd need to know the individual case as to why there's been a 12 month gap and i think it is just about having those conversations with the specialists that you've got locally to make sure that that plan is correct can I just jump in there, Claire? I think one of the issues that we know nationally, I know Lincolnshire, you obviously have got the new service. It's not every area has got a children's continent service, mm -hmm. unfortunately. It is a bit of postcode lottery still. And where the services exist, there are some areas where they're massively under-resourced, like the lady we've just heard from, where there's one nurse for the whole area plus one nursery nurse. So in some areas, there are long waits. And COVID has had a significant impact on services, with particularly in, in the um, phase, what are the... Um, when we had the first peak with services being redeployed and that has increased waiting times. There is a lot of information for families on um, websites such as ours. There's also information on the stopbedwetting.org website that families can go to for first line advice and there are national helplines, ours included, where families can go for advice and support if in the time they're waiting for that initial assessment to be yes. done by the tier two service if that's needed. But it is, un it is very unfortunate that un that is the case for some families as they are having to wait. I think it'd be interesting to know what, you know, what they're using as well in the meantime, because obviously alarms and things like that. Um, and, and we use all of the information that's on bladder and bowel. And that's exactly what we share with with families. So if they don't, like Davina said, if they don't have those specialist services, um, to, to just make sure that they can be doing, because there's lots of stuff that you can be doing in the interim, such as fluid intake, et cetera. And I think working with the GPs as well, you need to work very closely with the GPs where that's required. Okay, thank you. Um, right, the next question is for Davina from Joe. Can you direct us to any specialist courses, including virtual, dealing with children and continents? Yeah, I mean, there, it depends what level you want to work at. We do bespoke training at Blood and Bowel UK. There's more webinars um, supported by the companies, such as the one we're doing tonight. Um, the International Children's Continent Society have a very well respected e-learning course. It's not desperately cheap, but I don't think it's outrageously expensive for what they're asking either. Um, so there are courses out there. And if you're looking for something specific, I mean, email Bladder and Bowel UK. We'll happily um, give you some advice and suggestions depending on what you're looking for and what you want. Um, but yes, there is stuff out there. And obviously, there's a huge amount of, of evidence there as well. So I use the NHS um, Evidence and Journals website all the time. Um, for reading and and when I first came into post in children's continents a lot of years ago now there were very few of us nationally and there was virtually no training available anywhere and it was a case of, of reading what evidence there was and keeping up to date with that so you can do a lot of, of self-directed learning as well but if anybody wants support they're more than happy for them to drop me an email at bladder and value case um, email address Fantastic. Can I just add on to the end of that as well? Um, obviously, we have actually gone to um, Bladder and Bowel UK um, and we've got a bespoke package written and, and Davina supported that. And it's absolutely outstanding because all I did was provide what our service offer is and the service specification. And it was built around that. Um, and it's absolutely vital um, for us to enable us to, you know, secure this service and make sure that, you know, the nurses are, are up to date. That's brilliant. OK, um, the next question, the questions are coming in thick and fast. <laughs> the next one is for Davina. Um, are there any set standards in care that, children, that schools should provide children with incontinence? Yes, there are. There's, um, in England, the Department for Education provides guidance to schools. So they have um, guidance on the Equality Act 2010. They have guidance on managing pupils with medical conditions in school, which is based on the um, Children of Families Act 2014. And Bladder and Bowel UK worked together with Eric and we actually wrote a guidance for schools. And we also um, wrote and we've published in Word so schools can actually um, amend them themselves, a care plan, a suggested um, intimate care policy, and also a toileting charter 
and all of those are available on the schools area of the children's bit of the Bladder and Bowel UK website. So yes, there's lots of stuff out there and we regularly get helpline calls from schools or from families about issues in schools and how to manage them. Yeah. Um, schools are getting better and we're providing better information to the schools as well, which is helping them. Great. OK, uh, next question for you, Lynn. Um, how do you work with your adult services when a child's care is being transferred? Um, again, we are incredibly lucky. Um, as part of the ESSITY, um, we meet um, anyway regularly. And I think being in that room, it's enabled us to develop pathways um, and also working relationships with the adult um, service. They do have the um, same as us. They've got a couple of um, tiers. They have obviously the district nursing and then they have a specialist um, continent service for adults. Um, we've got all of their contact details. At the moment, um, it is a transition form that is completed. Um, and we, are, as the children's element, are looking at um, doing that all through System 1 as well, which is our record keeping audit. Um, I, I am in the process of arranging a meeting with our adult services so that we can look a bit closer at what those transition points are. As I said in my presentation, currently it's around the age of 18 years and six months that that um, starts. But we want to bring our element especially forward to around 14, 15 years. Um, and then the child will have a package that goes with them. Um, and the idea will be that they will transition and they shouldn't know that, you know, it's seamless. They don't know that they've gone from one to the other, shall we say. Um, and then we will do a follow up. Um, the, there has been challenges, especially over the last year, because a lot of the adult service were actually redeployed, whereas as children nurses, um, we weren't. Um, but we do have their contact um, details and we just pick up the phone um, and discuss any children where there are more complex needs or it's not going to be a case of a straight, straightforward transition and they're going to need more support with that. Um, but we have got work to do. I think we do need to strengthen that and we need to bring the age forward. OK, um, we've touched on this in a little bit, but this one's for, 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 for Lynn again from Lisa. Um, what training did your staff undertake alongside the competencies? And was it a module or some specialist bladder and bowel training? Um, it's a little bit of a mixture. So some of the staff in the um, tier two service, they've actually done um, accredited modules. Um, so they've done specific bladder and bowel courses. Um, others haven't. Um, for our tier one service, a lot of the training is, is what we develop in-house. So those that have got that specialist training, they write the training packages. Um, and we also have um, some community practice educators, so they can also support with putting training packages together. With regards to the tier two service, um, we've obviously been to Davina, who has developed us a two-day bespoke package, um, which will be more in-depth for those tier two members of, of, of staff and then they can look at how they can use that information again to teach our, our tier one so the health physician and the children young um, people's nurses um, they've also got some eric um, modules coming up that have been booked um, and we are also booking on to the iccs so the international children's continent society um, we are in the process of booking those modules as well um, there's also a few modules on um, health education england um, so a lot of the tier one, they're, they're quite nice to look at those ones with regards to, to bladder and bowel. And also Essity have provided some training um, modules and they've done um, various different ones. I can't remember the titles now, though, but they have and a lot of staff have also undertaken those. So there is lots of opportunity to look for training, not necessarily going off and doing a full, full blown, like long course with, with lots of modules. There's lots available. Um, so it comes to our final question, um, just a, a kind of short concluding question to both of you from Lucy. If you could improve your service in any way, what would you change? So that goes to you first, Davina, and then you, Lynn, after. I'm not sure, to be honest. I think more staff um, would be lovely. That's a luxury, isn't it? Um, I just work for Bladder and Bowel UK at the moment. I haven't been in the NHS for a little while. Certainly, if I think about the NHS um, service that I had, it was very much about staffing. 
Um, we were very, very short staffed, I've sped very, very thin. Um, and it was very, very difficult for the children, and young people who were waiting for that service. So I think, I think that's one of the key things. I think looking nationally, what I would like to improve across the country, um, which is one of the reasons why we wrote the PCF commissioning guide, is to actually um, have a service in every single area um, with properly with proper resourcing of those services and the sort of quality of service that Lynn's developing. That's what I would, would like to see. And, Lynn? and I've, I've, I've got two, I think. The first one is around staffing. Um, currently, we have got some vacancies in our children and young people's nurse um, element. And obviously, the tier one is really, really important because um, that's where a lot of the prevention um, and all of that lower level work comes, which prevents children going on to needing medication or, or more intense treatments. Um, so that would be one. Um, I think secondly would have been to push push harder to have got to this point sooner than what we, what we have done. Um, and my ambition, and somebody actually asked me this the other day with regards to why, why I was so excited about this presentation this evening, is I would love to have some influence um, on government to make sure exactly the same as what Davina said, that we get the same service everywhere. There should not be a postcode lottery for children's health. And actually, if we get it right from the beginning and with children, you're actually reducing a lot of the burden on adult services because you've dealt with it. Um, and I think for, for the outcomes for children as well, they shouldn't be suffering in the way that some children children are. So, Can I add one in as well, Claire? And that's a bit cheeky sneaking at the end. Like, but it's edu <laughs> education education yeah. for all healthcare professionals so we don't have anybody telling children your child can't toilet train or constipation is normal or and that we get rid of those myths i think education for everybody brilliant thank you both so much <laughs> thank you so thank so you. this concludes our live training session uh, thank you so much everyone for engaging and thank you SET, for supporting this event the certificate link you should see on your screen now um, and if you like the UCCT Facebook page to hear about future events first. So that just leaves me to say take care, everyone. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.